Torah Life Ministries come out of the world. Messiah people seek the truth. Shabbat Shalom, brothers and sisters. Welcome to another Sabbath message we are doing here on this week's Torah reading. And this week's Torah reading is going to be Deuteronomy 21.10 to 25.19. Now, for those of you that are joining us for the first time or are not familiar with the Torah portion, it's not a Jewish thing. It's a Bible thing. This is a thing that uh, with the foundation of Scripture for all the people we know in Scripture in the Renewed Covenant, also known as the New Testament. The Bible is not two books, it's one book. And we need to separate that page that takes the Old Testament and the New Testament, and it needs to be one. And we need to look at this complete book with these instructions and guidelines. And the first five books of the Bible, starting in Genesis, going all the way to Deuteronomy, are filled with the important instructions of the will of our Creator and how He wanted us to live and carry out our lives. It's beyond what we're doing today, but it's what we need to strive to do. Now, I don't want anyone to get confused before we get into today's teaching. The Torah and these instructions are not a salvation issue. If you're not meeting these instructions perfectly, it doesn't mean you've lost your salvation or you don't have salvation. The salvation issue we can discuss in another video, and that is uh, where we get into understanding who Yeshua, our Messiah is, the one they call Jesus, and what his role is, and what his uh, importance was. But these instructions and guidelines from the beginning of time are what our Creator wanted us to follow and how He wanted us to live for our safety, for our blessings, for our life, and for His plan to be carried out for us. It says in the Scriptures, Know the plans I have for you. They are for good and not disaster, to give you a future and give you hope. The Torah is His plan for that future and that hope. There's another verse in the scripture that says, there's a way before each man that seems right but ends in death. And that's the way many people have chose to live today. I give before you life and death. Choose life so you may live. When you make that decision to follow the Torah, the guidelines and instructions of our creator, you are choosing life. Now, we're going to look at this week's Torah reading which is the 49th reading of this year. It's Deuteronomy 21.10 to 25.9. Now, I will be the first to admit in this week's Torah reading, there are a lot of rules and regulations that we can't even comprehend and do not make sense to us about slaves and, 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 and killing rebellious children and all this. We need to take the Bible in a literal way, but we also need to understand the culture at that time versus the culture today. The Bible doesn't change. Our creator doesn't change. His instructions for us. The principles don't change, but the culture has changed. So we need to consider that when we're looking at these things and consider what the culture was then as we're reading these guidelines and instructions. So when you hear somebody today say, well, I don't believe in the Bible because they talk about slavery or I don't believe in the Bible because they talk about stoning and all this. Fast forward that to a culture today. The purpose of slavery in scripture was not about oppression. It was about uh, a support for somebody who needed it. It was about uh, taking care of everyone around you in the way that the system was formed back then. Slavery today is oppression, so I understand why some people would think that, but it's not the way it was back then. So that's just to give you a little background of the importance of this uh, Torah, the guidelines, instructions, and so on. So this week, we're going to look at something that the principle still stands through to today. And I haven't heard anyone teaching on this important uh, topic. So I think it's uh, extremely important we get out our Bibles and we look at this. So the Torah reading is 2110 to 2519. Uh, and we, we read through the Torah every week before the Sabbath, the Saturday when we read it, when we do the teaching. And as we're reading this Torah reading this week, we're going to focus on uh, two or three scriptures that are in the first chapter here of our reading. So the 25 verse 10 says, when you go out to battle against your enemies and Yah your Elohim has given them into your hands and you have taken them captive. So it talks about once you've accomplished your goal, you went out to battle and our creator has 
given the enemies into your hand. These were instructions of what to do with them. So understand where we are and what it says. And it says in verse 11 of 21 of Deuteronomy, it says, and suppose, suppose you see the captives, a beautiful woman, and you are attracted to her and want to marry her. So that's what it says in verse 11. And that's one of the things we're going to focus on. Then it says, if this happens, you may take her to your home where she must shave her head and cut her nails and change the clothes she was wearing when she was captured. She will stay in your home, but let her mourn for her father and mother for a full month. Then you may marry her and you will be her husband and she will be your wife. But if you marry her and she does not please you, you must let her go free. You may sell her or uh, you may not sell her or treat her as a slave for you have humiliated her. So this is a verse that a lot of people uh, read over. They don't think about it. And I am going to teach on this today uh, because it's important to understand what is going on here. And uh, we're going to fast forward here to verse uh, 22, verse 5, because this is going to be another part of this teaching today. In verse 22, verse 5, it says, There shall not be a thing of a man on a woman, nor shall a man put on a woman's garments. For whoever does these things is an abomination to Yah your Elohim. So these are the two verses we're going to talk about or focus on today because it's important to, to, to figure out what's going on here. Now, if you could turn your uh, turn to Numbers 3355, 3355 in your scriptures says, but if you fail to drive out the people who live in a land, those who remain will be like splinters in your eyes and thorns in your sides. They will harass you in the land where you live. So let's look at where we are in the book of Deuteronomy as we go through these verses and through the Torah reading. The children of Israel uh, left Egypt where they were captive. They spent all this time in the wilderness. And now here they go into the promised land. And there were a whole bunch of people already living there. That our creator helped the children of Israel to be victorious over those people to take the land. And our creator gave instructions of what to do and not to do with those people. And basically, his instructions all throughout the Torah was destroy them. Separate yourself from them. Do not follow their customs. Because if you do, they will, they will be a problem for you. You will start to go after their guards. And this is, uh, this is going to be a tremendous issue. So in Numbers 33.55, we look at one of the many areas it talks about throughout Scripture where it says, if you fail to drive out the people who live in a land, those who remain will be like splinters in your eyes and thorns in your sides. They will harass you in the land where you live. Now, if you fail to, to drive them out, it was only because you weren't trusting and listening to our Creator because He promises you will be able to destroy them. So Moses led the children of Israel in the wilderness for 40 years until they got to the promised land. But something interesting happened right before they went into the promised land. Moses died. And a new person was appointed to take them into the promised land. And it was Joshua. And Joshua uh, led them into the promised land. And when Joshua became old and he was about to die, he gave them his last final instructions in Joshua verse tw uh, chapter 23. It says in chapter 23 from verse 5 to verse 14, this land will be yours for the Lord your Elohim will himself drive out all the people living there now. You will take possession of the land just as the Lord your Elohim had promised you. So now when we think about that verse in itself, and we go back to the previous verse, it says, if you fail to drive out the people. But here in Joshua, it says, this land will be yours, for our creator himself drove out the people or will drive out the people living there. 
So we see this here, the difference. The people had a choice to drive them out. Our creator said he, he, he will drive them out himself, but the people had to listen to our creator. He says, but if you fail to drive them out, if you fail to be obedient. So now we continue it. Joshua 23, verse 6. It says, so be careful to follow everything Moses wrote in the book of instructions, which is the Torah. Do not deviate from it, turning either to the right or left. Make sure you do not associate with other people still remaining in the land. Do not even mention the names of their gods, much less swear by them or serve them or worship them. Rather cling tightly to Elohim. Yah, your Elohim, as you have done until now. So he's telling and warning them, when you go into this land, do not associate with the other people. Now, here comes the warning, because all these time in scripture, when they gave the instructions, they gave a warning what would happen if you don't follow them. Verse 12 of Joshua 25 says, but if you turn away from him and cling to the customs of the survivors of these nations remaining among you, and if you intermarry with them, then for certain, Yah, your Elohim, will no longer drive them out of your land. So here's a warning, not to cling to their customs and not to intermarry with them. And then it says, goes on to say, instead they will be a snare and trap you, a whip for your backs, a thorny uh, uh, brimes in your eyes, and you will vanish from the good land Yara Elohim has given to you. So when we think about this, it seems kind of contradictory to what it said earlier. It says, if you go in and you take a woman captive and she's beautiful and you take her as a wife, it says you may marry her. And if you take her as a wife and it gives these instructions. But here in Joshua, Joshua is saying, do not intermarry. Do not follow their customs with these survivors. Do not deal with them. So why will it, why, why did this happen? And here is what my study and prayer has shown me that I want you to understand and how it applies to us today. I will submit to you the customs of immodesty lead people to lust. Our creator has a history of modesty for men and women. And when immodesty is around, lust is spurred up. Keep that in mind, because this was the customs of the people that the children of Israel were warned not to intermarry with, not to uh, mingle with, not to associate with, but to destroy them, to get rid of them, to separate themselves from them. This is what's happening. We continue to read Joshua 23 and what he was saying. Towards the end, he says, soon I will die going the way of everything on earth, deep in your hearts. You know that every promise of Yah, your Elohim has come true. Not a single one has failed. And Joshua gives them this warning in verse 15 and says, but sh as surely as Yah, your Elohim has given you the good things he promised, he will also bring disaster on you if you disobey him. He will completely destroy you from the good land that he has given you if you break the covenant of Yah, your Elohim, by worshiping and serving other gods. His anger will be burned against you. You will quickly vanish from the land he has given you. So we have a president here that says, Yah will go before you. He will wipe out all your enemies. If you follow his guidelines and instructions, this land will be yours and you will be fine. You will, you will, war, you, you will just, everything would be wonderful for you in this land. But if you do not listen to the guidelines and instructions of our creator, it's going to bring disaster on you. These people are going to become a snare in your eyes. Do not go and worship their gods, whatever you do, or y'all will take this land away from you. And what we have here, when we go back to this week's Torah reading and we see where it says, if you see 
the captives a beautiful woman, attracted. This was an immodest woman. It was an immodest culture at that time. It was an immodest woman that opened up the lust. The heart and the eyes of the lust of man was opened up to see this woman where without even knowing who she was, Yah says the, the beauty of a woman is, is eternally and it comes out. But without even knowing who this woman was, just seeing the beautiful form of this woman, this man of the children of Israel wanted to take her as a wife. Wanted to take her as a wife. It wasn't too long ago we saw in another Torah reading about uh, Balak and Balaam in Numbers 25 when Moab seduced Israel. And the way they did it, they weren't able to conquer them in war or anything like that. But it says in, 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 in Numbers 25, while the Israelites were camped at Asiya Grove, some of the men defiled themselves by having sexual relations with the local Moabite women. These women invited them to attend the sacrifices of their gods. So the Israelites feasted with them and worshipped the gods of Moab. In this way, Israel joined in the worship of Baal Peor, causing Yah's anger to blaze against his people. We have to go back and see what we're looking at here today. Joshua told them, be surely do not worship the other gods. And the instructions were when you go in and you see a woman that's attractive to you. When you see a woman that's attractive to you. But then it goes on to say, it says, uh, when you see this and this is happening, it says, take her into your home. Change her clothes she was wearing when she was captured. She was most likely following the customs of those people and wearing something very immodest. And the men of Israel that came into the town and saw this were attracted to, to, through their lust to the immodest woman to see things they shouldn't be seeing. No man should be seeing a naked woman except his wife. Okay, maybe one is a child, his mother. Maybe his siblings in the house. But you know what I'm getting at. A man shouldn't be seeing the form and the nakedness of a woman unless his wife. And in the courtship and instructions of Yah, that cultivation and beauty of that woman is going to come out through getting to know her. And that's how you're going to know the woman is from Yah, the woman is for you, and it's going to work out fine for you. But they lived in a culture back then and we live in a culture today the same way. Men are worshiping the, and lusting after the outer beauty of a woman. They're not getting to know the inner beauty of a woman, which it talks about in scripture of how to identify the true beauty of a woman from an inner, inner character. And men on the street today are falling for the same issue that they fell for back then. You see, in Torah, there's principles that we need to learn and take with us today. And men are doing the same thing. They are attracted to women through the lust of their eyes, through the immodesty and vanity of women today that society is promoting, that the enemy is behind, that the demons are behind. And they're making men, even men of Yah, attracted to the wrong type of women for the wrong reasons, in the wrong way, not getting to know them, but just simply because of the way they look. That's what happened. When we look at this week's Torah reading, and you suppose you see among the captives a beautiful woman, and you are attracted to her and want to marry her. This is the problem today. Men are going on the street seeing an attractive, beautiful woman, and they will want to create a, a, a situation where they're giving up their lives for that woman who they don't even know. So marriage is looked at in a different way today, but they're, they're connecting with this woman. They're, they're, they're fornicating with this woman there. They're giving up all their money and their life and everything for a woman just simply because of her attractiveness, for her nakedness, for her shame, which Yah calls it. But Yah tried to fix this. In this week's Torah reading, as we saw, it says, 
If this happens, you may take her to your home, but you must shave her head and cut her nails. Now, I can only imagine after seeing the women today, how much they worship their hair and how they make their hair all sexy. Our creator says the hair is the glory and the beauty of the woman. That the woman should have a head covered during prayer. Well, if a true woman of Yah is ceasing, uh, praying without ceasing, our hair would be covered a good amount of time. But we look at this. The hair is worshipped today and it's one of the most attractive things that a woman today. And Yah says that woman should shave her head and to cut her nails. I can only imagine with seeing the woman, the way the women carry their nails today, all fancy and long and everything else, how it must have been then. But Yah said, strip her of her, of her immodesty. This is what he's saying in this week's Torah. Suppose you see among the captives a beautiful woman or an immodest woman, and you are attracted to her immodesty, to her body, which you shouldn't be seeing at this point, and you want to marry her. You're about to give up your life for the woman you don't even know. If this happens, you may take her in your home, Yah says, but, but take away her beauty. Take away her immodest. Take it away. Shave her fancy hairstyle. Cut off her fancy nails and change those immodest clothing what she was wearing when she was captured. And let her stay in your house. It says to let her mourn for her mother and father. But it says, let her stay in her house and for a month, you know, let her mourn them. So Yah's taking this situation where maybe a young man, a young soldier is going in and he sees this immodest woman, he's attractive to her, knowing nothing about her. And he says, all right, you're interested in that woman? Take her in your home. Take off her beauty. Put some modest clothes on that woman. Cover up her nakedness. Take off away her hair and her nails. Let her walking around modest and, and, and walking around modest and, 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 and now she's going to mourn her parents. So now you're seeing her in a mourning state. You still want to go and marry her after that? Now that you, you, you're seeing her at, 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 I won't say her worst, but you're not seeing her walking around flaunting her body and everything else. You know, he's trying, this is what he's done. He, he's trying to help people. He allows people to do what they want to do. The free will of our creator allows people that they want to do. But immodesty and, and leads to lust. Lust leads to, to improper worship. And that's what happened with Balaam and Balak. And that's what's happening today. And we need to, 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 to be careful. Men, if you truly think the woman that you know is from Yah, you must learn to cultivate her inner beauty and get to know her for her inner beauty, not for her out of physical appearance that every man in the world are seeing and lusting after. This is what we see here. Somebody might say, why did Yah give this woman or, 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 or instructions to the man to marry him. He didn't. He didn't. He said, if, suppose you see this woman, if you want to marry her. He didn't say you should marry her. It says, if you desire to marry her. If you desire, and we look at that word desire, if this happens. He didn't say go and marry her right away. He said, wait, get to, get to know her. Get to see her situation. Let her stay in your home. But if you marry her and then she doesn't please you, let her go free. Now, I have a whole lecture on this other topic, a whole thought thinking about this other topic, because that is not scripture. If you marry her, let, you know, and she doesn't please you, you know, since you humiliate her, don't treat her as a slave and let her go free. That's another lecture for another time. We'll get to that part. But the point is, do not let your eyes deceive you and don't let lust carry you away. Don't let lust carry you away. This is a message for today. And we must understand this. We must get this. Let's go back to Genesis. Genesis 3 verse 5 says, Our creator, our wonderful creator, Yah, knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you will be like him, knowing both good and evil. See, our creator designed us in a way, even though we had a vision. We had a vision. He didn't want us to know certain things. 
He didn't want us to understand certain things. Adam and Eve didn't need clothes back then because the whole comprehension of, of lusting and nakedness and shame, they weren't even concepts back then. They weren't uh, subjects back then. But when we go to Genesis 3, 7, it says at that moment when they ate the fruit, their eyes were open and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. The wickedness in the world that was not supposed to be uh, even touched by man, understood by man, had changed once their eyes were opened. And at that point, the lustful desires took place. And the motivation for what men and women did changed. And, and the world had gone wrong since that point. Prior to that, you wouldn't have these issues. You know, we look at the, the result of the sin and what it's cost and what it causes today. And once their eyes were open, this lustful desire to look at the outer beauty of women happened. See, up to that point, y'all wanted it to be the inner beauty to shine through a woman, to, to, to be exalted in men. But it changed at that point, and everything went wrong from that. Not a couple of verses later, in verse 6, it says, The people began to multiply on the earth, and the daughters were born to them. The sons of Yah saw the beauty of the woman, saw the beautiful woman, and took them to be their wives. This is the problem we have today. This wasn't a good thing, and it's not a good thing today. For a man to see a woman, and he wants her to be a wife, his wife. Any time in scripture, a man saw a woman and wanted her to be his wife without knowing that woman, it was part of physical attraction and lust and things like this. It was only when a man saw the inner beauty and the inner uh, character of a woman that he could truly know the woman was truly from Yah. Now, there are different cultures and different times back then when uh, people got married right away and, and, and marriage and ceremonies were looked at different back then and covenants were looked at different back then. So there were certain uh, ideas and exceptions to this when it was truly uh, granted by Yah where somebody would, would see a woman and know that woman was from Yah and, and take her as his wife. But for the most part, we look at the corruption that happened when man's eyes were open and they started to desire the, the outer beauty of women and women desired the things that Yah punished them for in terms of Yah told the man he would have to work hard. Yah told the woman she would have to submit to a man. And you have the whole feminist movement and everything today changing the structure of that and revealing the true colors of women wanting to be in control. And to do that, they're manipulating men, understanding men have this lust attraction and they'll give up their whole lives pretty much to marry an immodest, impure woman just because they're attracted to out of physical beauty. And, and, and the enemy is driving this to have women walking around, seducing men to make this pledge to pretty much give up their lives. And the scriptures talk about the, seduct the seductive type of women and how to avoid them. But we saw here the sons in verse 6 of Genesis, the sons of Yah saw the beautiful woman and took them and wanted them as their wives. Then Yah said, my spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh, only mortal flesh. And in the future, there will be no more than 120 years. And then we look at uh, the idea of Noah and Noah, Yah's getting ready for Noah to come and, and wipe this. This, these lustful people out and wipe them out. It says in those days for the some time after giant, uh, the giants lived on the earth. And whenever the sons of Yah had intercourse with them, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors. It says Yah observed the extent of the human wickedness. The extent of the human wickedness was in fact what was part of it was the, the, the lust being carried away by the lustful eyes. You know, it's just like when you go back to Eve. Satan had to use something, and he used the beautiful fruit 
to entice her. The enemy, I will say, uses the beautiful woman, the outer beauty of a woman, to entice the men. And it, 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 it's, it's a problem. It's a big problem. And it continued. This is the problem with Adam and Eve and what they did. And when their eyes were open, it continued even after the flood. After Noah, uh, you know, had the ark and after the flood, not too much longer we look. We go and we see Abram and we see uh, Sarah or Sari at the time going in uh, to, to the land. And it says, when Abram came to Egypt, this is in Genesis 12, 14, we're still in Genesis. The Egyptians saw that Sari was a very beautiful woman looking at the outer beauty. And in any culture today, when the women are free to walk around in a particular way, it's going to create a tremendous problem. Does this mean Sari was walking around uh, immodest or was, or, or, or was doing something? No, but we it understands that the inner lust of man's eyes is something that must be protected must be protected. So the, when the men of Egypt took a Sari without even knowing her because they were attracted to an outer beauty without even getting to know and almost created great, great sin. But our creator intervened and saved that. And uh, only blessed be to those men today that our creator is going to intervene and men are going to listen and not continue to make this terrible uh, mistake. In 2 Samuel 11, verse 2, one day David got up from his bed and walked around the roof of his palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. Was David attracted to this woman because of her inner character, because of her strength, because who she, he didn't even know who she was. He saw her naked body. And the lust of his eyes let him get carried away. Men are visual, and this is what's going to get them into trouble if they don't control this very thing. And, and I'm going to give you all these examples in Scripture. Even men of Yah, even men of Yah are susceptible to, to this great kind of wickedness. So men, you must be careful, about, careful around immodest women because the enemy is disguising himself in the form of an immodest woman looking to devour and destroy you. You need to make sure you are not getting carried away by these immodest women. And it's just about everywhere today, everywhere today. And it's, it, it, it's, it's a big problem. Genesis 29, verse 8 and 12 says, we can't water the animals until the flocks have arrived. They replied, then shepherds move the stone from the mouth of the well and water will what are all the sheep? So we're looking at Jacob here and what happened with Jacob. So Jacob was still there. Jacob was uh, talking with them when Rachel arrived with her father's flock, for she was a shepherd. And because Rachel was his cousin, the daughter of Laban, the mother's brother, Jacob went over to the well and moved the stone from his mouth. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and he wept. He explained to Rachel that he was a cousin, father's side, the son of uh, the end of Rebecca. So Rachel quickly ran to her father Laban. There was no spark. So, so what happened here was you had uh, Jacob you, 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 hanging out there, talking, you know, just at the well. And then here comes Rachel walking by. Walking by. Now, was she an unattractive woman? Was she an unattractive woman? Look what it says. It says, in verse 17, there was no sparkle in Leah's eyes, but Rachel had a beautiful figure and a lovely face. Since Jacob was in love with Rachel, he told her father, I'll work for you seven years if you give me Rachel, your younger daughter, as my wife. Now, even though Rachel was a righteous woman in scripture or turned out to be a righteous woman, she was part of an unrighteous house. She had an unrighteous father, an unrighteous brother. There's a very good chance that she took part in the custom of dressing in an unrighteous way at that time. 
a very good chance because that was the custom. That was the culture of the way they dressed. Regardless, we have the evidence here of even men of Yah being seduced by the outer beauty, the physical attractiveness of women so much so. What does he say? For it says, she had a beautiful figure and a lovely face. How did he know she had a beautiful figure? She was most likely revealing it. Since Jacob was, I'm not saying she was walking around naked, but immodest clothing was most likely part of that culture. Since Jacob was in love with Rachel, how long did he know her here? A couple of days? How was he in love with her? He was willing to work seven years of slavery for Rachel. The lust of his eyes. The lust of his eyes. Seven years for this beautiful woman. And why wasn't he attracted to Leah? Because she didn't have that sparkle in her eye. She wasn't as attractive and so on. Now, I admit that there was probably some uh, fulfillment or idea from Yah that this is the woman for me because of the, the way it happened and the prayer that took place. But it would still the outer beauty before he got to know the inner beauty that says he loved her. When we look at love and we look at the idea of love and marriage and everything today, you really need to get to know a person before you can even admit that you love a person in that type of way. And when you say you love a person in that type of way, it's usually a, a desire of lust because of the attractiveness of her outer appearance. And I will say it again. This is what's getting people in trouble today. This is what's getting people in trouble today. And we go back to this week's Torah reading. We're not jumping around. We're going back to this week's Torah reading. The men took the women captive and were attracted to their beautiful form. And it led them to these problems. Only a few days he knew her. And then Laban agreed, I'd rather give it to you than anyone else. So Jacob worked seven years for Rachel. What man today is going to work seven years for a woman he doesn't know? I'll tell you what, man, the average man that doesn't understand the, the way the enemy works and the way women are brought up today in a feminist movement and the way the court system works, and the average man today is worshiping women and is creating a tremendous problem, a tremendous problem. This is why the children of Moab got themselves in trouble. They fornicated with these women. And this is why people are getting themselves in trouble today. Thankfully so, it was Yah's will for Jacob to be with Rachel. Thankfully so that uh, it all worked out. And thankfully so, the enemy didn't bring some other immodest, immoral woman to, to seduce Jacob before Rachel showed up. This is a warning to men. This is a warning to men. Matthew 5, 28 says, but I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Men, be careful. Be careful. I appreciate the certain cultures around the world where men are told not to gaze at a woman, where men are, are recommended to look away and not stare and, 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 and fall into that trap. This is also what the scriptures tell us, but people are not following that. And today it's worse than ever before. And it's more difficult than ever before because Everything you turn away is just flooded with images of women and the message that women are sending today. And when I say women, I don't mean all women. There are certainly modest women of Yah that carry themselves in a different way. I'm talking about what we see. And I can't just say the world today, but it happens just as much inside the church today, inside your congregation today where men are attractive first to a woman's outer beauty before her inner beauty. 
And that itself is the issue that we must be careful from. Proverbs 6, 23 to 26 says, for their command is a lamp and their instructions is a light. Their corrective discipline is the way of life. It will keep you from the immoral woman, from the smooth tongue of a promiscuous woman. Don't lust for her beauty. Don't let her coy glances seduce you, for a prostitute will bring you to poverty. This is scripture. Proverbs is wisdom, and this is what it is saying. And you might be watching ladies and saying, well, this isn't a message for me. And I will tell you it is because you have sons and you need to teach them this. And fathers, you need to teach your sons this as well. Do not, as it says in scripture, lust after the beauty of a woman and don't let a coy glances seduce you. It'll bring you to poverty. It's such an important message that I don't hear anyone talking about, but needs to be spoken about. 1 Peter 5, verse 8 says, stay sober and stay alert. Your enemy, the adversary, stalks about like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. This is the reality. Men are designed in a way to be attracted to the, the, the form and the shape of a woman. As we see in scripture, that's the downfall of so many men. But before man's eyes were open, they didn't fall into this. They didn't have this worry and this issue. The women and the men were, you know, it was a different situation. But once Adam and Eve sinned, things changed. Job 31.11 says, For lust is a shameful sin, a crime that should be punished. It is a fire that burns all the way to hell. It will wipe out everything I own. We must, must, must keep our eyes away from the detestable things of this world. And this is what we are looking at when we see here in this week's Torah reading. We go back to it. How in the world does it say, and you have seen the woman in, cap uh, uh, in, in captivity, women of beautiful form. You should not be looking at a form. You should not be seeing her form. This is for uh, after the covenant of marriage, not before. And it's Yah's protection for the woman and the man. And Yeshua warned us to not lust after, after a woman. Do not open his door for the enemy to get in. And I know people say, well, I'm a man of Yah, or many of Yah don't have this information and everything else. In Psalms 10, 13, it says, uh, King David said, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Do you know that was before he looked at Beersheba? Not after. It was before. And then he looked in his window and he saw this woman and look what happens. He committed all this great sin because of the lust for this beautiful woman. Judah is another great example of this problem. Genesis 38, 14 and 15. Judah was going to do his normal business in a town. And he saw this prostitute along the road. And even though her face was covered, I'm sure her body wasn't. And he saw this prostitute. And he ended up sleeping with her. And it ended up being his daughter-in-law. Another example is with Samson and Delilah. This is how the eyes get us in trouble. Samson, one of the strongest men, if not the strongest man physically to ever live, but was made weak by a woman, not just once, not just two times, but three times. In Judges 13, 25, it says the spirit of Yah began to stir him up. So we see Samson, a man who was supposed to have the spirit of Yah. But in Judges 14, verse 1 and 3, it says one day Samson was in uh, Timnah, and one of the Philistine women caught his eye. Caught his eye. And his father said, Stay away from the pagan Philistines to find a wife. Why must you go there? But Samton told his father, get her for me. She looks good to me. This is supposed to be the savior of Israel, the, the, the redeemer, the healer of Israel, the strongest man. And then we see the second time in Judges 16, 1. One day Samson went to the Philistine town of Gaza and he spent the night there with a prostitute, being swayed away with his eyes most likely. And then finally, 
A third time in Judges 16.4, Samson fell in love with Delilah. And she enticed Samson to tell what made him strong and how he became overpowered. His eyes were his weakness because he did not take control over his eyes. He did not take control over his eyes and he was punished. And what's the first thing? And this is, this is interesting because we think this was a, a punishment, but this is Yah and how he works. What's the first thing that they did to Samson that, allowed, that Yah allowed to happen to Samson when he was captive, captive, the first thing, they took out his eyes. Yah allowed him to lose his true weakness. They took out his eyes. Amazing. Amazing. To my sisters that are watching right now, I humbly remind you of this verse in 1 Peter 3, verse 3 and 4. Your beauty should not consist of eternal, such as fancy hairstyles, gold jewelry, or whatever you wear, rather, or what you wear, rather let it be the inner character of your heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit. In Yah's sight, in Yah's sight that is of great value. Ladies, do not let a man see you in a way that he should not see you until he gets to know your inner character and marries you. To my brothers, remember what it says in the scriptures to stay alert, to stay alert. When Paul and Peter went to the non-Jewish people, to try to teach them Yah's instructions and Yah's Torah. It was finally agreed upon in Acts 15, verse 20, the four things that must be done to, to at first, at first, it doesn't mean they need to follow the rest of the Torah, but at first it was to abstain from the physical polluted idols, all the meats sacrificed to idols, to stay from what is strangled, to stay from the blood that Yah's told them not to eat, and to stay away from fornication. James' suggestions were essential because they knew they were the exact sins the Israelite, Israelites committed with the Moabite women in Numbers 25, and they can easily happen again. Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, God your heart more than anything else because the source of your life flows from it. Proverbs 23, 19, my children, listen and be wise and keep your heart on the right course. Think about this. Listen to what Job says in 31, verse 1 of Job. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust at a young woman. A covenant with my eyes. I have, in, in 31, verse 7, if I have strayed his pathway, or if my heart has lusted for what my eyes have seen, or if I am guilty of any other sin. So, Job knew it was a sin to lust. He says it right here. If my heart has lusted for what my eyes have seen, or I am guilty of any other sin. Now, specifically, we're talking about men lusting after the beauty, the outer beauty of women. But women are guilty of their eyes seeing things that they're lusting after also. But this is what Job is, is getting at. And Psalms 119.37, turn my eyes away from the worthless things and give me life through your word. We need to, to be disgusted by immodesty. It is a tremendous, tremendous issue going out there today. And I will suggest that pornography is the enemy's way of uh, of getting in the community, just like back then it was the Moabite women, and today it's through pornography. And a lot of people will say, well, pornography is something in print or something on a screen, and it's not in real life. But I will suggest to you that immodest dress, if you are dressing immodestly, you are magnifying the problem of pornography to some of the men who see you. So if you are dressing in an immodest way, even though it's not in some magazine or on some video, it could be real life pornography. 
The definition of pornography is the, the depiction of erotic behavior intended to cause except, a sexual excitement and the deception of acts of sensual manner so as to arouse quick, intense emotional reaction. Erotic behavior intended to cause sexual excitement. And these are the definitions of this pornography. And I've said it before and I explain it again. And this is so hard uh, for, for people to get and understand. It seems so innocent. What's wrong with me wearing a tank top? Or what's wrong with me wearing uh, shorts or, or going around wearing a belly button shirt or something else? Men have to control their own side and leave me alone. I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm not bothering something that they have to control their lust and everything else. You can't walk around being a, 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 an open uh, Playboy magazine and continuously put it in front of these men and expect not something to happen that on every level is going to have some form of wickedness from the enemy. You must learn to, to put on the uniform of Yah and dress in a modest way. And modesty, not according to the standards of this world, but according to the standards of Yah. And I tell you this, and it's so hard for people to comprehend, understand because of the corruption of this world today, but everything, including the fake up, the makeup, the face paint women put on to mimic their, their selves in a time of, uh, of, of sexual desire to say, I am available. I want to have your baby. And women are walking down the street in this mask. They might as well have a sign on their forehead saying, men. I want to have a baby and I am fertile. Come sleep with me. That's what makeup does. That's what the designers do. They puff up the face and they make the face look exactly as the way a fertile woman would look. It's just like with cats. When a cat's walking down the street, the male cats know when the female cats are in heat because the female cats give off certain signs to show they're in heat. Well, I am telling you, ladies, when you wear makeup, the designer specifically made that makeup to look like you are fertile and you want to have a baby. And the men are attracted because the men's natural instinct is to have babies and to mate and make babies. And when women are walking around in an immodest form, showing off their bodies and wearing this makeup, it's a sign saying, take me, I am available, and I want to have your baby. And this is creating this tremendous problem. Understand the sin of this uh, of pornography leads to more sin, and it's just, it, it kills people spiritually, mentally, and physically. And we know this, the lust of the eyes, whether it's in physical print or physical form. Everything from the enemy that comes from our eyes being open and understanding this. This was the problem that we have in, in, in the Torah reading and Deuteronomy this week. When the men went in there, the last thing they should be doing is looking at these immodest women and taking them into their houses. And taking them into their houses. Can you imagine your son going out in the street and finding an immoral woman, a woman that's not of Yah, has no principles of Yah, dressed immodestly where her body can be seen and bringing her in your house and then telling you, I want to marry this woman. That's what Samson did. And that's what the guy did here. And if your kid was doing for that, you would not stand for that. But this is what even men of Yah are doing today. And it's creating such a problem, such a problem. First Corinthians 6, 18 to 20 says, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you do not know that your body is a temple of, of Yah, whom you have from Yah, and that you are not your own, for you have been brought with a price. Therefore glorify Yah in your body. First Thessalonians 4, verse 3 and 4 says that Yah's will for you is to be holy and stay away from sexual sin. Each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor and not in a lustful passion like the pagans who do not know Yah. 
Colossians 3 verse 5 says, therefore put to death what belongs to your worldly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, greed, which is idolatry. James 1, 14 and 15 says, each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Romans 16, 19. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you use uh, to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and every increase in wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness. Listen. You might think you're holy by following the Torah and the guidelines of our instructions of our creator. But if you're having these problems of lust within you, if you're having these things with Yeshua told us to even look at a woman with lust is committing adultery. You have not understand the true nature of how our creator lives and what holiness truly is. And when you look and think about the the Holy Spirit, the Rahada Kodesh, he will not approve of this. You are choosing to listen to the enemy and, and to reject the Holy Spirit. You are creating a downward cycle. Pornography, masturbation, lust of the eyes, sexual impurity, fornication. One leads to another. And men and women have this responsibility. Yes, 100%. I, when women say, well, men have to control their lustful desires, 100%. They must take control of their eyes. And I pray this message will not be condemning, but freeing and helping men realize this. Even in a secular world today, men that have success with women and getting the women that what they want whether it's uh, for uh, the idea of marriage or for whatever impure idea they have the success comes down to not getting carried away uh by, by lust and doing stupid things but by making wise decision not letting the beauty of a woman seduce them we have to understand the way the enemy works set your heart towards a wonderful creator and, and, and be focused on his word, not the filthy, immodest world we live in today. 1 John 2, 16 and 17 is for the world office, only a, a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but from this world. And the world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases Yah will live forever. I am telling you, young men today, including me, are brought up to not get this message, to go against this message. We're brought up uh, not to be masculine, wise men who have control over their eyes and can control their lustful passions. And we succumb to it. And just because you have succumbed to it, or maybe you've succumbed to it right now and you're you're, you're, you're suffering from this. The Bible says repentance brings refreshing. And I can tell you, as a young man being brought up and falling into this trap way too many times, repentance brings refreshing. Repentance brings refreshing. And to make that decision to change our lives and to following according to the scriptures and not letting the temptation of the world sway you away in any way. And as I said, men, it might be through the lust of your eyes and women, it might be through you seeing things, other things you shouldn't be seeing. And it's not only the physical eyesight because even men, when you're not looking, you got to look at the, 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 the perfumes and smells of this world and the clicking sounds and the words and, uh, uh, that, are, that are being said and spoken. And we must shut ourselves, our ears, our eyes, and everything, our senses to the impure things of this world so we do not tempt or, or, or let that temptation carry us away and we stay strong in our wonderful creator. That we will not get so prideful, let's say, not me, this could never happen to me. For the world's strongest men and the most powerful men in the world were brought down by an immodest woman. The enemy knows what he is doing. And I pray. 
I pray every single day that we can be protected and make wise choices. We must, we must be careful. As Yeshua said, everyone who looks at a woman with lust for has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And the sin that grows over time. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away from his own, by, uh, of his own lust. And then when his lust conceives and brings forth sin. And sin is finished. It brings forth death. James 1.14. Be careful what's happening and what we're doing. Be careful. I once heard a, a lecture called Holy Eyes. And it says... Uh, talks about a, a rabbi that was walking down the street. He had sunglasses on and he painted them black. He painted them black. And somebody said, you're going to lose your eyesight. You're not looking around wherever you're going or whatever you're seeing. And the rabbi said, I'd rather lose my eyesight than lose my soul. It says in Matthew 5, 29, if your right eye costs you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than to lose your whole body and to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. Keep discipline your body. It says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I myself had no, how somehow will not be disqualified because I keep discipline my body. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we acknowledge our sin, he is faithful. And he will forgive our sins and cleanse us from every wrongdoing. Now, I am not recommending you cut off your cut out your eyes or cut off your arms and your hands. I am not recommending that. But I am suggesting that many of you will say that that's crazy for me or the scriptures to even suggest that. That we would lose one of our body parts to, to save our soul. But I see people going every day into the hospital taking off their body parts to save their physical life. They're getting amputated, their legs, their arms, and they're getting all these different body parts amputated and organs taken out of their body to save their physical life. Well, how important is your spiritual life? Thanks to Yara, our wonderful creator, he says repentance brings refreshment. If anyone is listening right now, if anyone is watching right now, and you suffer from these sins, these lustful thoughts, these lustful, lustful passions, whether it's for men who are suffering a fit or for women who are inducing it, women who, are, uh, who don't see anything wrong with dressing in a revealing way, don't see anything wrong with wearing uh, face paint that's seducing men, and you don't have any idea that what you're doing is wrong. Or if you're a man and you don't see these things, I pray that that you would come see this and realize this and, and your, your, your eyes would be open to this truth that we shouldn't be having any part involved in this and that we could be better, we could be stronger and we could be wiser in the decisions we make. As it says, again, we acknowledge our sins and he is faithful and just and will forgive them. We can start new right now, start today right now. One of the biggest, most common ways that the enemy, Satan, will destroy us and attack our, our life with Yah is to try to uh, uh, affect our purity and to get to it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And Yah is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. There is a way out. You can overcome this. Galatians 5, 16 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The Torah readings are not some ancient uh, stories that we should just read and move on. They're for us to learn and grow and learn from the mistakes that others made, to learn how to carry our lives. 2 Timothy one verse seven says, for the spirit of Yah gave us, does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Ephesians 6, 11 to 13 says, put on the full armor of, Yah, uh, armor of Yah so that you can take stand against the devil's plans. 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world and against the spiritual force of evil. Therefore, put on this full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, yes, hallelujah. If you struggle with this, pray about this. Pray about this. Philippians 4.18 says, finally, brother, whatever is right is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good, repute. If there is any excellence, if anything is worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Remember, turn my eyes away from the worthless things and give me life through your ways. It's time to confess your sins and pray to Yah. And we no longer be, be conformed to the patterns of this world. And we let Yah and ask him to really, truly change our minds. That we'll be able to uh, know what your goodwill really is for us. And to cleanse us from all wickedness. And to trust that he will set us free. Hallelujah. Clothe yourselves with Yeshua, our one of the Messiah. And do not think. Uh, about how to glorify the desires of the flesh. To put aside those things. We can know all things if we trust in Yah with all our heart and not rely on our own understanding. Resist the devil and he will turn from you. Resist the devil and he will turn from you. Make sure the woman that you decide to marry, you get to know her inner beauty. The inner beauty and be warned. Don't just go along to the first attractive woman you see. It says in Proverbs eleven twenty two, like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. We have to understand the root and to separate and divide ourselves and not act like the people of, uh, of Egypt and Canaan. It says in his scriptures in Leviticus, we must not imitate their way of life. This is why we understand Yah had a plan for us to come together and to help one another. And in this week's Torah reading, it says in Deuteronomy 22, 5, the woman shall not wear that which pertains to a man and neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do, so are an abomination to Yah. That is in this week's Torah reading. Remember, going back to the beginning of this week's Torah reading, it says, and if you have seen in the captivity a woman of beautiful form, a woman of beautiful form, I will tell you this, not many of you might be mature enough to hear this or to understand and get this. Not only is the industry of makeup putting a sign on your face saying you are fertile and you want to have a baby, you want to mate with somebody, take me, that's what that says. But the idea of showing off your form, this is not a, logis a, a legalistic scriptural thing. This is something that will, will, will upset some of you, but the reality is that woman that that man saw at the beginning of the Torah reading, was showing off her form. And it says here in Deuteronomy 25, the woman shall not wear which pertains to a man and neither a man shall put on what pertains to a woman's garment. And we can go to many different places with that today, especially in today's time where men and women are looking alike and dressing alike. But I will tell you one thing throughout, throughout history that has always separated the form of a woman and the form of a man or showing off that form was pants. Women wore skirts, and that's what covered their form. I'm not talking about tight skirts. I'm talking about loose flowing skirts. That's what hid their form. But when women started wearing pants, yes, even loose pants, the enemy knows what he's doing. It started to show off their form. It was only in the 60s that women started to wear pants on a normal basis, but it goes against what scripture is saying here. And you say, show me in scripture where it says, Women can't wear pants. It says women shall, should not wear uh, 
belongs to a man, but it also gives us the idea all throughout scripture that the pagan women showed off the form of their bodies. And that's not the way women should be. And women should not be showing off their bodies. So you think about this, ladies. When you're walking down the street showing off your body in these pants with your face painted and signs on your face saying, take me. What kind of stumbling block are you creating for men today? This is right from the Torah. Right from the Torah. Oh, you're adding to scripture. You're changing scripture. I'm not sinning if I'm wearing makeup and wearing pants. You are are, are uh, promoting exactly what this whole thing, what we're talking about here. You're promoting it. You're allowing it. You're allowing the enemy to get to it. And the, the average man today is not brought up to understand this and see this, but the average woman is not brought up like this either. And it says in Proverbs 30, verse 20, this is how an unfaithful wife behaves. She eats, wipes her mouth, and says, I did nothing wrong. Well, this is the same thing where the unmarried woman today, the single woman today who's walking around immodest will say, I did nothing wrong. It's his fault. It's his lust. It has nothing to do with me. It has to do with, with, with understanding the love for one another and not contributing to the enemy's attacks on men and ultimately on women and all this crazy stuff. Women say men just got to get their minds out of the gutter. Well, women have to stop dressing like they're from the gutter. Remember, what shows your true beauty is the inside, not the outside. You don't have to compete with the pagan women of the world that are, are looking to seduce men left and right with their tight pants and their makeup and all this. And understand the advertising that, that, that makes this happen. The advertisers know what they're doing when they make pants, when they make makeup, they know what they're doing. When they make the perfume to smell a certain way, when they make the high heels clicking and the position of high heels put in the body. And ladies, you might be thinking, well, that's not me. I don't have that desire to feed Satan's uh, lustful men and all this stuff. But I will tell you this, you could listen to this or not, but it will save you, it'll help you. Purity of motive does not cancel out the effect of your appearance. You might have the purest heart, no desire to provoke a man to lust, but that does not cancel out the effect of your appearance. Be careful. Be careful of what you're doing. Be careful of what you're doing. It says in the scripture in Proverbs, a man is led to the house of an immoral woman like an ox led to slaughter. Proverbs 7, 7, 10 says, I saw some young naive man and one in particular who lacked common sense. Men aren't brought up with the common sense today. They're brought up by the uh, political and public school system uh, and, and, and unknowledgeable parents that are not teaching them this sense. And it says he was crossing the street near the house of an immoral woman, strolling down the path of a house. It was twilight in the evening. As deep darkness fell, the woman approached him, seductively so dressed and sly of heart. So she seduced him with her pretty speech and enticed him with her flattery. And he followed her at once, like an ox going to the slaughter. Ladies, you might not think you're creating this issue, you're feeding this issue, but think if your man, your son, your son brings home a woman who's dressing in an immoral, immodest way. How, where does your line change when that's your son? Or if your husband's talking to somebody at work, where does that line change? If your husband's working with women at a, that are, that are dressed in a modest way versus dressed in an immodest way, does that make you feel any different? Remember, when we think about this, Corinthians 10.30 says, whatever you do, whatever you wear, it's eating or drinking or anything, do it as to bring glory to Yah. And Paul says in Hebrews 3, 12 to 15, be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not, uh, are, are not evil and unbelieving, turning away from the living Elohim. You must warn each other every day while it's still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and harden against, your heart harden against Yah. For if we are faithful in the end, trusting Yah, just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to him. 
Revelation 16, verse 15 says, take note. I will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Blessed are those who are not watching for me. Blessed are those who are watching for me, who keep their robes ready so they will not need to walk naked and ashamed. Shamefully exposed. Micah 6, 8 says, Yah has already told you what is good and what is right. He demands from you to do what is right, to love grace and walk in purity with your Elohim. As we read the Torah reading this week, some of these things from a cultural standpoint will not make sense to us. But it is my prayer that today I've brought out to you the principles that our creator wants us to follow. And I have other teachings online about modesty and the way we should carry ourselves as believers. And also, if we're going to get into relationship and, and, and desire to find a spouse, we should get to know them, uh, women for their inner beauty, the, the, the true beauty of a woman, the inner beauty, and not just be led away by the lust of her outer beauty, to certainly not make a commitment to a lifelong, uh, a lifelong commitment to a woman you don't even know the way that it appeared what was happening today in this Torah reading, but to really Think about Yah's plan and Yah's way and the type of uh, woman that Yah wants you to be with as a man and the type of woman Yah wants you to be with as a woman. To not follow the ways and the customs of the Egyptians where you came from or the Canaanites where you're going. Or the world today. Or the world today. This message isn't going to sit good with, with many of you. Many of you see no problem with the with, with, it, with the things discussed here today of doing these things. But I know the advertisers. I know the, the, the companies. I know the history. And I know what these things do. And I am telling you, there's nothing, nothing that's good about makeup and pants on a woman's body. It just shows off their form and, and, and sends the wrong message. And I'm saying this, and people don't want to hear this. It is the truth. It is scripture. And you could disagree with me all you want. There are many people that are being led away by lust. And I'm not going to stop giving out this message. It's not a popular message. It's not a message a lot of people want to hear. You know, but, but we need to, to know what Scripture says and take these teachings of the Torah to heart. So I pray that, that, that they, they help you. And this message in no way is, is talking against uh, men or women, you know, it's warning you against the, the, the covenant that Yah wants us to make with one another. And that we do not make this the same mistake. Because when I read this and it says, you have seen uh, in captivity a beautiful woman, a beautiful form, and desire her. And desire her. There's only, we, we need to be careful with desire and what we desire. We need to be careful with that. We need to understand that. And, and, and there shouldn't have been a desire for her to begin with, but she was, he was led astray. All right, everybody. Thank you for reading this with me. And uh, for your comments and questions below. And um, praise y'all for another blessed Holy Sabbath day. And if you're watching this at a different time, you don't keep the Sabbath day. Uh, that's a whole nother topic that I have teachings on that you can see in the scriptures talk about. Uh, but just remember Yeshua more than anything, the one they call Jesus. Not my words, but his words. And his words were, for even a man to look at a woman with lust is committing adultery. And you might say, well, I'm not married. How can I commit adultery? Think about, think about our Elohim. Think about the adultery that the people committed by going after other gods and thinking about how this immodest woman could sway you to follow other gods like the children of Moab, uh, the women of Moab seduced the children of Israel. All right, everybody, thank you. Yah be with you. Have a blessed day. Hallelujah, everybody, and uh, shalom, shalom. Torah Life Ministries come out of the world. Messiah people seek the truth.